the baskets, the petition boxes, or at the shops. But when the Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires, Jorge Bergoglio, stepped out onto the balcony of St. Peter's in Rome on March the 13th, 19, or 2013, I, he was introduced as Francis, Bishop of Rome. And I thought to myself, fasten your seatbelt. This is going to be a bumpy ride. Because in just a few minutes, old paradigms were broken, and through very clear symbolism, we knew that we didn't just have another pope. We had a prophet in our midst. He didn't wear the elaborate papal robes. He used a simple white cassock, said that the cardinals went to the end of the world to find him. He said a simple good evening in greeting the people. Then he humbly asked their blessing before he gave them his blessing. And he said that he had chosen the name Francis because of his determination to fight on behalf of the poor. So it was definitely not business as usual. And that became clear as he set about creating a group of cardinals to assist him, as he began a major reform of the Roman Curia. And he also set about starting a listening process in preparation for the synods on the family. Never before in the history of the church has a pope dared, as Francis does, to put the question of sexuality at the center of the church's debate, focusing on questions about remarried couples, questions about homosexuality, questions about condom use, and so on. And in face of the realities of the scandals of pedophilia, of the 100,000 priests who left the priesthood to get married, and the physical and symbolic violence committed against gays, Francis criticizes the cynicism of those who dare to throw the first stone. He insists on taking these issues out of the exclusive realm of theory and bringing them into the arena of everyday human experience. These dilemmas are things that ordinary people and families and communities meet all the time and so they must be dealt with by human attitudes of compassion, of love, of acceptance and solidarity, and not judgmental attitudes. Pope Francis is very clear about the evolution of doctrine and teachings based on the correct understanding of tra tradition. He says that human self-understanding changes with time, and so also human consciousness deepens. Let us think of when slavery was accepted or the death penalty was allowed without any problem. So we grow in the understanding of the truth. And what that means is that we must move from a narrow view of doctrine to a more comprehensive view of looking at doctrine. In times past, the Catholic Church accused the Jews of being killers of Jesus. They condemned to limbo children dead without baptism considered slavery as being legitimate, and didn't approve of the practice of charging interest on loans. But the real sin is to accept the mechanisms of exclusion and proceed to select humans by biological, racial, sexual, or ethnic factors. All are sons and daughters loved by God. All have the same essential vocation to love, and to be loved. And the law, Jesus always insists, is made for the person and not the person for the law. And Francis asks, when does a formulation of thought cease to be valid? And he says, when it loses sight of the human or even when it is afraid of the human or deluded about itself. A young man came to talk to me a couple of years ago and he told me that he was 22 years of age and that he was thinking of ending his life. He felt he couldn't go on because he was so unhappy. He said, I'm gay and no one knows. I don't know how I can tell my family. And while I was talking to him, I remembered the story that I had read a few weeks beforehand of Eric James Borges. Eric was a young American who was teased his entire life for being different. 
and Eric recalled emotional and physical abuse as far back as kindergarten, all because he was different. And though most children will undergo some degree of hazing from time to time, the seeming indifference of the adults in, in Eric's life made matters dramatically worse, getting to the point where he was actually physically assaulted in a full high school classroom while his teacher stood by and watched. And this distressed teenager had nowhere to turn at home either. His Christian parents decided to perform an exorcism on him in the hope of curing him of his sexual orientation. And when that failed, they just kicked him out of the house. And when he was 19, Eric killed himself. And in the suicide note he left, he wrote, my pain is not caused because I am gay. My pain was caused by how I was treated because I was gay. Now the difficulty that the church has to accept LBGT members as equals is due to a tradition of over 2,000 years in which only heterosexual relations were regarded as normative. So those who oppose any change in the church's attitude react as if the Pope was betraying the church. They forget that in times past, uh, other opponents reacted the same way when changes came in the way the church viewed certain issues. For example, when they refused to accept the separation of church and state, when the, the autonomy of science was accepted, when the freedom of conscience was recognized, when sexual intercourse within marriage that didn't have procreative intention was recognized, and the use of even of the vernacular in the liturgy. In all those situations, people kicked against it and said that the Pope was betraying the church. At the time of Jesus, the, the segregated were pagans, they were the sick, they were those who exercised certain professional activities such as butchers and and income tax collectors. And with all those, Jesus had an inclusive attitude. He accepted them all. Later, the victims were indigenous people. They were blacks, heretics, and Jews. Nowadays, the victims are Muslims. They're poor immigrants. They're gays. The Chilean Juan Carlos Cruz, who was a victim of sexual abuse by a priest in Chile, was received by Pope Francis, and they spoke in private. And Francis told him, Juan Carlos, the fact that you're gay doesn't matter. God made you that way, and God loves you as you are. And I don't care. The Pope loves you as you are. You need to be happy the way you are. And in his, his encyclical, The Joy of Love, the Pope teaches that people that are in so-called irregular situations can still live in the grace of God. They can still love and they can also grow in the life of grace and love and receiving for this the help of the church, which may also include the sacraments. For this reason, Pope Francis reminds priests that the confessional, where normally the sacrament of penance is ministered, is not a torture room, but the place to experience the mercy of God. And the Eucharist is not a prize for the perfect, but rather a generous food and medicine for those who need it. Like Jesus, the church cannot discriminate against anyone on grounds of sexual orientation, on grounds of skin color or social condition. Because what's at stake is the dignity of the human person, the right of gays to be protected by civil law and to educate their children if they have children in the Christian faith. And also at stake is the combating of homophobia, which is a grave sin. St. John in his first letter says, God is love. Love is from God, and any, everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. In other words, we are made for love. And as the presence of, of God among us, Jesus moved easily without discrimination between the world of sinners and the world of refuge and righteous. He didn't stone the adulteress. He didn't run from the prostitute who wiped his feet with her own hair. He didn't deny to Mary Magdalene, who had seven demons, 
the special grace to be the first witness to the resurrection. And at the same time, Jesus didn't refuse to engage in dialogue with the righteous. He accepted dinner at the house of the Pharisee. He welcomed Nicodemus in the dead of night. He dialogued about Samaritan love with the doctor of the law. And he proposed to the rich man who from a young age had obeyed all the commandments that he make an option for the poor. Above all, Jesus thought that it is not climbing the mountain of moral virtues that we achieve the love of God. That's what the Pharisees thought. Rather, Jesus thought that it is in our surrender to the love of God, free and merciful, that we achieve fidelity to his word. No one chooses to be homosexual. No one chooses to be heterosexual. The person is born that way. And in the light of the gospel, the church does not have the right to brand anyone as being homosexual or being heterosexual, but simply as sons or daughters of God, called to communion with God and with his or her neighbor, recipient as well of divine grace. Jesus didn't criticize people who were weak but still trying. Jesus criticized people who were strong but not bothering. For example, the rich man who doesn't bother to help the poor man lying at his door. The religious leader who doesn't bother to consider that someone needs healing on a Sabbath. And the Pharisee who doesn't bother to offer Jesus a welcome. For Jesus, sin was a failure to bother to love. How often do all of us fail to bother in this way? How often do we see, fail to see the importance of the lives of people who are different? How often do we sin this way? Now the story I'm going to tell you, I'm not sure if it's actually true or if it was constructed, but I, got, I received it on WhatsApp, but I think it's worth sharing. Christine, after her son came out as gay, decided to expel him from her house because she refused to allow a homosexual live under her roof. And this attitude was rejected by her own father. And he wrote a letter to Christine, trying to get her to review her opinion. Dear Christine, I'm disappointed in you as a daughter. You're correct that we have a shame in the family, but you're mistaken about what it is. Kicking Chad out of your house simply because he told you he was gay is the real abomination here. A parent disowning her child is what goes against nature. The only intelligent thing I heard you saying in all this was that you didn't raise your son to be gay. Of course you didn't. He was born this way and didn't choose it any more than being left-handed. You, however, have made a choice, a choice of being hurtful, narrow-minded, and backward. So while we are in the business of disowning our children, I think I'll take this moment to say goodbye to you. I now have a fabulous grandson to raise, and I don't have time for a heartless B, he used the B word here, of a daughter. And then he finishes, if you do find your heart, give us a call. I wonder have any of us lost our hearts? Maybe we could go look for them. I have some petitions here. Um, a petition for Anthony, a young man who was in a motorbike accident and is probably still being operated on as we speak. My family, uh, a petition for my family, help him through everyday life and to find happiness and be healthy. Jobs are very scarce, so help them to get something they love. Dear Mother, please pray for my son who has been bullied in work for the last seven years. It is having a devastating effect.